regreso aquí en Auto 060. Eh, muy interesante toda esa información que nos eh, estaban dando sobre el cambio de aceite en el auto, las precauciones que hay que tener. Y ahora eh, vamos a hablar a un tema que yo creo que nos interesa a todos. Estamos viendo cómo la industria china de los autos está avanzando eh, a, gran, a gran velocidad. Primero, con la compra de vehículos eh, en China, que es eh, realmente espectacular. La misma General Motors, por ejemplo, el Buick, que es uno de los autos más vendidos en China, y los autos de lujo ni se digan, los, eh, no dan abasto los fabricantes de, de Bentley, de Ferrari, de Lamborghini, de Maserati. Eh, y así que vamos a hablar con eh, nuestra colega eh, Christy Schweinsberg de WordsAuto.com, quien estuvo recientemente en China en una conferencia y nos va a dar eh, sus impresiones sobre lo que, lo que está pasando y lo que va a pasar con el mercado del auto chino. So we're switching out to English to listen about the uh, Chinese auto industry with Christine Schwanzberg from wartsautos.com. Uh, Christy, thank you very much. Uh, Christy from uh, wartsautos.com. Uh, uh, thank you very much for taking the time uh, and talking about your recent uh, trip to China. Thank you, Javier, for having me. I appreciate it. A very interesting uh, headline, as always, a uh, very catchy headline. Uh, China still five to ten years away from being a Western player. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, place, I guess. I've never been so. Can you give me your like first impressions of that? Well, um, I was in Wuhan, which is a city in the, in, basically in the center of China, and it's considered a small city in China, although it has 10 million people. <laughs> um, it, my, my first impression was that um, it, it was definitely uh, different than the U.S. Um, they, they have modern structures, but uh, they're not quite as advanced in their building techniques as we are here in the U.S. in terms of, you know, uh, high rises and roads. The road, the road we came in on from the airport was very uh, rough and it was undulating. And uh, so they, they, in Wuhan anyway, they've, they've got a bit of ways to go to, uh, to match the, uh, the standards of, you know, American building and construction. Um, But everybody I met was was very nice, and I stayed at a uh, Western hotel. I stayed at a Renaissance, which is a Marriott uh, brand in, in Wuhan, and uh, went to this conference, Global Automotive Forum. It was the fourth time the conference has been held, and they uh, wanted to have uh, Western media this time. So they contacted a gentleman they know in Detroit, uh, and he uh, invited – or they asked him who would be good to invite to the conference, and they invited myself, and they also invited uh, the crew of Autoline Detroit, John McElroy, and uh, his uh, his uh, producers, and uh, some other people. Reuters, Bloomberg was there. Uh, New York Times was there. So um, we, we gathered together to learn more about the Chinese auto industry. Yeah, and uh, this uh, impression that they are five to ten years away, it's based on uh, the quality of the product, the technology, the engineering. What, what is it? I mean, because, I mean, they're already in uh, some countries, like uh, in South America. I, I don't know if in Europe. I don't think so. But, like, they're already exporting cars. So why is this impression that they're still uh, that that long time away from being a major player? Well, mainly uh, what I'm speaking about in the story is markets that have uh, barriers to entry, such as, you know, fuel economy regulations, emissions regulations, and safety regulations. So you can't sell in Europe or, or the U.S. unless you meet, you know, uh, NHTSA, EPA regs, uh, NCAP and Europe regs. So um, in, in that respect, they're five to ten years away from creating a vehicle that is able to be sold in those markets that has the type of technology that is required by, by the governments in, uh, in the U.S. and Europe. And also, like, to make it uh, profitable for them, right? Because I remember when, remember when Tata uh, announced, like, five, seven years ago that they were going to start making the $2,500 uh, $2, car, uh, the Nano. And uh, that car, I mean, was, like, a big news. And I remember I asked Bob Lutz, who at the time was still with GM, and I asked him, when are we going to have that kind of car in the U.S.? And he said, he already have it. It's a Chevy Aveo, but it costs, like, $12,000. <laughs> So right. it's, it's pretty mean, much the same thing, right? Yeah, I, you know, the Chinese have have low labor costs, but it still is going to cost them basically what it costs every other automaker to outfit their vehicles with the technology they, they need to meet the safety uh, 
regulations and the emissions regulations and the fuel economy regulations. So once you do all that, once you create, you know, let's just say a, a small car like an Aveo, um, yeah, the, the, the price discrepancy between a Chinese branded small car and let's say a Japanese brand of small car being sold in the U.S. is not going to be that great. You know, they're they're going to be almost as expensive as, as say, you know, a ten thousand dollar Nissan Versa. So, um, so so that's a concern. Um, but but really, what the panelists were talking about and what I I based my story on was that, um, you know, the Chinese right now to to a Western consumer to somebody in the United States when you think of Chinese produce goods, not just automobiles, but anything made in China, you think of those goods as being cheap. Yeah, they don't have a yeah. very good reputation yet. Yeah. Right. And and cheap is basically, it, it means poor quality, you know. So what, one of the um, the panelists was talking about, Bill Russo, who's a, a very well-known Chinese uh, auto industry consultant, um, was that you need to change the brand image of your product. You know, he was speaking basically to Chinese domestic manufacturers, uh, that they need to cha- change the brand image of their product. And, Actually, and, of the whole you know, country, no? Like you were t- t- talking about other products. I mean, they have to build that, the brand, the China brand uh, in general. Right, right. And it's been well reported that, you know, there still isn't a major brand that's come out of China that has taken hold in the West. You could say Lenovo, but that's, you know, against Samsung or Apple, yeah. Lenovo is not really a very big brand. So, you know, where is China's Samsung? Where is China's Apple? You know, we've not seen it yet. And, and certainly we've not seen it in, in autos. Um, yes, the Chinese automakers are selling in other markets, but there are typically markets that don't have the barriers to entry that, you know, the major markets do, like the U.S. and Europe. So, so in that sense, I mean, I think, I mean, if we take a comparison with the Hyundai and Kia from from South Korea, uh, they've been already in the states for like more than two decades, but uh, their reputation only has been uh, built up in the past what five, six years. So it's uh, probably longer than five to ten years, no? Uh, yeah, five to ten years may be uh, ambitious. Um, he, the the one gentleman I quote in the story, Bill Russo, was saying that uh, for some automakers, they might they might be closer. He mentioned Great Wall, which um, is a is a automaker of uh, of like light trucks, SUVs, pickups, um, the type of vehicles that aren't really sold um, in the in the U.S. anymore. That are sort of just basic body on frame light trucks. Um, he thinks they might have, you know, they might be able to come in five years, but others are going to take longer. Um, and then there was another person on the panel, uh, a, a Chinese uh, executive that talked about, um, you know, there's there's a lot of paperwork involved in selling in other countries. There's a lot of negotiations. You've got to manage cultural differences, um, you, you know, you, if you're going to sell in a foreign country, you probably should have employees that live in that foreign country. Uh, so how do you integrate those people with your Chinese management? Um, you know, there's there's issues of technology sharing that can arise. Uh, it's it's a very complicated proposition. Yeah. And uh, and so – and also, you know uh, – the U.S. market isn't really growing very much. I mean, it's, you know, this year has been a pretty good year, but relative to the type of growth they've been seeing in China, you know, everybody, there really isn't, there aren't a lot of people that don't have a car that want a car, yeah, you know. Exactly. If, if anything, there's people that aren't driving, you know, younger the gen, younger generation isn't driving uh as much as they used to. So exactly. and and the brands sold here are, are good brands and they're they've got good quality very, very and tough they're reliable. Competi- yeah, very tough competition. So I guess for now we're gonna keep seeing the quote unquote journalists from China with uh, cameras and tape measures under the cars at the auto shows, right? <laughs> oh yes. I mean they they certainly are studying the uh the Western and the, the developed uh market manufacturers uh with very much vigor, and they, uh, you know, they're they're in all these joint ventures with Western automakers in China, but the technology sharing is not really happening because, of course, 
you know, no company wants to give away their trade secrets, so um, the Chinese are are still learning. But they but uh, they are investing heavily. I think they now own Volvo, right? So I mean, uh, there's like they making some progress, not with their own brands, but like as a, as an industry, and maybe that's a, a first step. Right. Um, yeah. So acquisitions is is one way for for the Chinese domestic companies to gain a foothold in the West, and Geely. Um, Is, is the owner of Volvo now. But you have to remember that Volvo technology and the vehicles now was developed by Ford. Eventually, Geely is going to have to, you know, create new platforms and new powertrains, and, and that's, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how they do. Um, you, you know, you're not going to be able to use the Ford technology forever, so they're exactly. going to have to go it alone pretty soon. Yeah, Christy Schweinsberg uh, from uh, wordsauto.com. Uh, thank you very much again, as always, for your time. Very interesting. And uh, our audience can go and look uh, for more information about this in, in uh, um, wordsauto.com, right? Yes, they can. Um, I've got a story I'm, I'm just finishing up now, an uh, interview with uh, the lead designer for Cherry, uh, which is a major Chinese domestic manufacturer. So that should be coming up later this week. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christy, and uh, see you soon at another out event or maybe at the auto show in L.A. Of course, Javier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Y ya regresamos aquí en Auto 060 con una historia de la chica que se enamoró del Mercedes-Benz CLA 2014. 